So I, I ask you to join me in welcoming Chris Valasek of Uber to our event. Uh, all right, so how's everyone doing this morning? Good? Get coffee, breakfast? It's the most important meal of the day. Um, so, you know, as he said, uh, I, I now work at Uber ATC, so if you have any questions about that, Uber ATC uh, does mapping, safety, and autonomy. And that's all I'm going to say about it, so no questions about that. Um, uh, I was a programmer in a former life. I, I used to actually write software uh, for uh, ISS's uh, intrusion prevention and detection system. So at one point I was a programmer. I was just uh, not all that good at it. And instead I went to research and uh, I guess we have the product that, uh, that is me today. Most people obviously know me for the work I did with the Windows Heap reverse engineering, right? Everyone read those papers? No, yeah, obviously not. Uh, you know, obviously uh, Charlie and I have been doing the car hacking stuff for a couple years. Um, it's been fun. I'm going to talk a lot about cars, but I'm going to try to relate it to stuff that, that is on the internet, right? Uh, fun fact, I once jumped rope for 45 minutes without missing. It's probably one of the highest accomplishments in my entire life. Most proud of that. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is what I'm calling uh, IoT security versus IO take it easy security. Um, while there's different impacts for different things, uh, I think we can learn lessons from both. Uh, then we'll move into the complexities. Um, this stuff is more than just software, right? It's where software meets hardware, and it makes security and, and security solutions um, a bit more complex. Uh, then uh, I'm, I invented a thing uh, the other day called the IoT Responsibility Triangle. It's pretty sweet. We're going to talk about it. And then finally, you know, uh, here's what I want to see as, as we move on, and then you can ask me any questions. Does that look good? Oh, I always love posing for the picture. Uh, uh, we'll cover first IO Take It Easy. Um, my, a really fun example is a, some research that uh, Michael Coppola did uh, a couple years ago where he hacked a Furby. And it was amazing because he documented the teardown of the actual Furby, uh, the communications, reverse engineered firmware. The kid was even doing acid baths in his dorm room to, you know, de-layer these chips. Amazing research. And you could learn a lot from it because it taught you about these uh, microcontrollers and how to get the firmware and how to reverse engineer them and how communications worked for things that are system on a chip, right? I thought it was fantastic and it was really great. Um, but to be honest, right, it doesn't really affect safety or privacy. Yeah, I guess you could hack one and you could spy using a Furby, but if you're going to do that, just plant a bug in someone's house. Um, it doesn't have high impact, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned from it because not everyone knows how to do these teardowns. Not everyone can reverse engineer as good as Michael. Um, so these lessons are put out there so other people can learn how to do these things. And I still think it's very worthwhile to have this type of research be done um, and, and not instantly dismiss it as, you know, a child's play toy, literally, right? Um, obviously, I have to talk about myself here. <laughs> then you have, I think, the, the other end of the spectrum, which is this high-impact stuff. Uh, some guy named Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek uh, ended up doing this car research, right? And we remotely compromised a vehicle from A to Z over the cell network, basically over the internet. Huge impact um, because you had this massive recall, which I thought was uh, you know, kind of amazing, right? A, a, a recall of physical things for a software security vulnerability, um, and, and there was a lot of news, and it was high impact, right, because there's safety. People were concerned that if you, you know, wreck a car, you could die, get hurt. Um, again, very important, um, just, I think, higher impact because it directly affects safety. But I don't think, you know, the, the, the lower impact things should be dismissed. Additionally, I don't think that every IoT vulnerability is high impact. I think everyone wants to flip out when it's something that isn't just a PC that's on the internet that there's a vulnerability. Software has vulnerabilities. Uh, I think we learned that. There will always be vulnerabilities. Uh, you have to you know, judge uh, how, how impactful these things are based on what the product does, uh, what the vulnerability is, and, and how it will be used in the future. 
Um, you know, I always said what might be in a Furby today could be in something as complex as a car tomorrow, right? These systems on a chip, these microprocessors, the communication channels, um, they're everywhere. Um, they're not just limited to one thing or another. Uh, you know, purchasers buy these things in bulk. Um, so you can have something that does comms in a Furby that may be used in a SCADA system. I mean, you never know. So I don't think you should instantly dismiss research on small little things that don't have high impact right away because it could have similarities to something that would have high impact. Um, and I want more information out there. I think everyone here can agree that there's a shortage of quality um, information security people, right? Um, the way I see it, the way to ramp that up is get more information out there. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of people hacking cars because it's expensive and there's not a lot of information. I hope there's more people looking at this stuff now that, that we put out information. I hope there's more people that looking at the same microprocessors that my, uh, Michael did in the Furby because he put that out there. Um, you know, high impact research can stem from low impact research. You can be doing this stuff that's simple and considered, you know, toyish, but you learn on these systems. They're easy to acquire. Um, and once you have the expertise, you probably are more confident to say like, hey, I'll write a proposal and try to get um, you know, a, a drone or, or, or a car or something crazy. Um, but you're not going to do that if you don't have the confidence that you can actually accomplish your task, which is to do a security assessment of something. So I don't, I don't like that things like that get dismissed. Um, that's one of the hard parts with InfoSec. It's one of the things I hate most about the industry is everyone's a jerk. Like everyone wants to tell you what you can and can't do. Um, you know, we're computer hackers, man. We, should, we shouldn't care what other people think. You should do it because you like it and it's interesting to you. Um, if you, if you want to hack skateboards or you want to hack Furbies, go for it, man. Publish it and talk about it at a conference. I'm not the one to tell you what you can and can't do. Um, additionally, we like to make fun of people. Again, it's, it's bad. Like, Ha ha ha, uh, you know, GM has this OnStar, they're stupid, they don't know anything about internet. We didn't all come out of the womb knowing everything about internet security. These, these companies that make these things, um, you know, some of them are powerhouses in electrical and mechanical engineering. That's a feat in its own. I could never create these things, but I'm, I just find that I'm good at breaking them. So I don't think you should instantly, uh, you know, really get on someone and chastise them for not not having perfect security first off because they're not going to know and they need our help. Uh, you know, the way I see it, we're InfoSec people are shepherds of the internet and we're going to tell you where you mess up and hopefully we're going to help you move forward and, and make it better. So, uh, I, I don't know, our industry is full of snarks. I wish it would die down a little bit, but I don't see it because uh, everyone gets 140 characters to voice their opinion, right? Um, other complexities. Um, specifically with cars and SCADA, this stuff was developed a long time ago. Um, everyone wonders why there's, you know, implicit levels of trust and no authorization, authentication, encryption. This stuff was invented in the late 70s and early 80s, man. These people didn't have to worry about this stuff. They didn't have a crystal ball that would show uh, what the world is going to look like in 2015. So they developed the things the best they could at the time. Uh, CAN bus, for example, kind of invented by Bosch, I think late 70s, early 80s, right? And it was a system for a bunch of nodes to communicate in a very reliable and quick fashion. Um, and at the time, if you had one of these, you were the one putting all the sensors and nodes on these things. And you're like, well, I made it. It's controlled. I should be able to trust everything because I developed the hardware and software that communicates on this. Um, and that was before we connected things. Um, and everyone says, well, you should just bolt internet onto everything. Um, that, that, that's, that's probably true, but at the same time, there's a lot of complexities that these companies have that, that regular software people don't have. Um, for example, I, I told you I'm the heap guy. Um, you know, Microsoft made this isolated heap. Basically, it said, hey, any object that was of this type uh, can't be some other type. And it helps with use after free vulnerabilities and makes browsers more secure. It's awesome. They completely refactored this, right, just recently. They can do that because it's just software. They don't care what, what hardware this heap is running on. They don't care if it's a laptop, a desktop, um, you know, even if it's uh, Apple's hardware. Um, it just runs and they're abstracted from that. Unfortunately, um, makers of things, uh, cars for example, 
can't do that. So the diagram there is the diagram uh, from the Jeep Cherokee, right? And you see the big problem was the radio that dealt with all the outside world stuff uh, talked to both CAN buses that had important stuff, braking, steering, acceleration, blah, 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 right? They can't just say, well, you know what? Um, Bring every, bring, bring every car in and we'll completely re-architect the, the, the network architecture and we'll make sure there's filters between those two things. That's impossible for them to do because you need to test those things and you need to ensure they work. And uh, I, I don't think they have enough time or money to add all this new hardware on the current version. That's why they have these long release cycles and they have to add these things over time. So you have to remember that you want to point out that there's you know, some lack of filtering or protection but they can't just refactor it and release a new software release. They can do some things with software, but a lot of the times they have to replace hardware. And honestly, that's an impossibility uh, for a large company that has a lot of things. Um, and, and, you know, so there's a lot of complexities with stuff. Um, and that's why I think that responsibility for the security of these things should be shared amongst uh, many people, not just one individual party. Look at that diagram. That took me all of 30 seconds to make in PowerPoint. Uh, I should definitely work for a graphic design company. Um, so my triangle of responsibility involves three parties. Um, your tier ones, these are people that supply parts to companies, right? Um, you know, I'll go through an example in the car, but basically you're a company and you make a product and you buy widgets from company X. Company X is your tier one because they give you the product. Uh, then you have the OEMs, right? They're the ones that contact the tier ones, get all these pieces and put it all together and make something awesome, whether it's a Furby or a automobile. So they're depending on their suppliers to give them good parts, right? Um, but at the same time, they're putting it together and adding functionality, so they're augmenting these things that they buy. And lastly, to, make the, uh, put, to put the internet in the internet of things, is you have these telecommunication carriers, right? They, they make sure that these parts supplied by the tier one to the OEM can communicate with the world, right? Your sprints of the world, your ATTs of the world, uh, anyone that, that really does communications. So really, they all work together to make these products that we know and love. Um, but I think they should all share responsibility about security as well. And uh, I'm a color by numbers guy, so I want to go through the, the G pack from all these three different angles. Um, the tier one in this instance was Harman. Harman actually made the Uconnect system. And, uh, and Fiat Chrysler bought a bunch of these Uconnects, probably like 1.4 million of them, uh, from, from, Fiat Chrysler, from Harman to put in their Fiat Chrysler cars. Um, but not all the weights on Fiat Chrysler, because if you look, here's a snippet of the code. There's, there's, the, there's the code that was made 1.4 million cars vulnerable, the execute method. We basically could pass it stuff, it would execute it. If you look at the namespace, service. this was code written by Harman. This was code written by a tier one and put onto this machine and you know given to Fiat Chrysler. So while they had this system, um, they, you know, they probably don't have the capability to completely audit every piece of hardware they get from every supplier because they have a bunch of tier ones they buy from. Um, so these tier ones need to think about security before they give these products to the people that consume them, right? You can't blame, uh, put all the blame uh, on FCA when, when Harman gave them a piece of equipment that had this type of vulnerability. They need to be doing their own security assessments or their own devices that they give to their OEMs. Secondly, you have a carrier, right? You have Sprint in this case. Um, the way we were able to communicate with these cars was we bought a burner phone, or I was dumb and got a two-year Sprint plan, uh, which I'm still paying off, uh, and, and we made it the internet hotspot, and then that was our internet, right? And from there, we could touch every car. And there's probably more stuff than cars on that network, because from our perspective, it was flat, right? Um, so any device on that carrier could talk to any other device that did stuff, and we could, you know, hit 1.4 million cars. Um, and th there's the port, it was port 6667 open, just TCP IP, how you would normally assess a network, uh, we did from these phones. 
Now, if you ask me, I don't think burner phones bought from Walmart should be on the same, you know, VLAN as all the cars or all the vending machines or all the whatever it may be, right? So you want your carrier to be aware of what's on their network and work with the OEMs to make sure that they have a certain level of awareness and we're able to, you know, uh, segment their, their networks properly. Uh, while, while FCA released a patch and did the recall, which was great for them, um, Sprint actually blocked all the ports. All those ones that say open right there on the screen, uh, if you rescanned after Sprint fix it, would say filtered, right? This, this prevented the attack more than anything. Um, while the recall was great and the patch was great, not being able to hit these cars over, over Sprint's network stopped actual attacks ever from happening, right? Because if you can't do it over the cell carrier, you have to be maybe close proximity to the vehicle to use Wi-Fi if they have that. Um, but you were no longer able to do the attack because I don't think every car is going to be patched ever that has this vulnerability. That's just the reality of it, right? People don't pay attention. Uh, they definitely got a USB stick in the mail that, you know, most people would say don't plug into your computer. So there, there's a lot of things that, that Sprint did as a carrier to remediate this problem. And lastly, you have the OEM that, that takes this tier one uh, supplier's part, puts it in whatever it is they make, and then connects it to, we'll say, the internet via their carrier. Um, these are the people that get a lot of the blame, um, but at the same time, they make mistakes too. So, you know, the way we were able to actually physically control the Jeep was there was code to update the chip that communicated with the in-vehicle network from the chip that did radio stuff. Uh, there was no signing of the firmware, no authentication, things like that. So, um, you know, this is their bad, and, and they're the one putting, putting this machine all together with parts from tier ones and talking to carriers, so they should know. I think they, they all should have some, some responsibility in vulnerabilities and just the, the general vulnerabilities of things they make. Um, FCA took it on the chin, right? They recalled all the cars, super expensive. They released a patch, super expensive. Uh, they took the knock on shareholder confidence, super expensive. Um, but that's not to say they're, they're totally at blame for all of this, right? Um, they didn't make all those parts and they didn't write all the code, specifically the code that we used to hack in, they didn't write. Right, so you know, while they put this part in their car, they probably had a certain level of confidence that their tier one was providing them pieces that made their overall system secure. And unfortunately, they can't have that assumption, right? And and it's expensive to test these type of things. So um, you know, it, it's hard to say what to do. But um, you, you definitely, as an OEM, someone who buys things, you need to question security and you need to test implementations of. Uh, as I said before, Sprint was the most impactful in remediating this process because um, they shut it down from a network level, right? Um, and apparently, there was probably some conversation uh, with FCA with their hair on fire saying, hey, hey, hey could you block this port? And they probably said, we don't know. We'll break all the cars. They don't know. Um, they eventually turned it off. Um, and what do you know? Nothing really broke. Um, but I think these parties need to be in more communication and they need to work together to ensure that the, the networks that they use for their products um, are, are kind of, each company is aware of each other from what they do because uh, I, I assume a, a carrier just wants to be a, a data mule, but unfortunately I think they share some of the responsibility for the security of the products they put on their network, right? Um, and lastly, you have the tier one. Um, you know, in our case, I, I don't think they ever released a, a patch. That, I, I always wanted to know if there were more Uconnect systems that weren't in FCA vehicles or on Sprint Network that exist. Um, we don't know, right? Um, have, have these flaws be, been fundamentally fixed? We don't know. The, the thing that you want to ask of these companies is when they do know about vulnerabilities that affect a certain OEM that they get the problems fixed for all their clients, right? As a business, you would want to ensure that all those parts that you've shipped out have a security fix to them, not just the people that got popped. Um, so I think all these people share some level of responsibility for securing the stuff on, on their networks, uh, the parts that they, they sell people, and the people that put it all together. 
So what do I want to see? I know, I know everyone always wants to say, like, don't, oh, why does that need Bluetooth, or why does that need Wi-Fi or Internet? I'm not, I'm not the Internet police. I'm not here to tell you what you can and cannot put on a product you're making. If consumers want Bluetooth in their baby monitor or they want Wi-Fi in their car, that's up to them. And I don't think security people should try to say what you can and can't have in your product. What we should do is try to help people put forth effort to better secure these devices and be aware uh, of security when designing them. Um, secure by the design is all fine, but uh, I think as, as was said before, people make mistakes, right? You need design review and you need implementation review and you need remediation review. What are you gonna do when this thing has a problem? Um, so I want people to innovate but secure late, uh, trademark pending. <laughs> uh, I, I think this goes without saying, but uh, OT updates seem like a must, right? Uh, I, I would think the rule of thumb is if you're going to connect it, you're going to have to update it. If it runs code, you're probably going to have to fix that code because as humans, we've proven that we're bad at writing code and we're bad at writing secure code. Every Patch Tuesday, second Tuesday every month, there's always a patch for Internet Explorer. We've been trying to write a good Internet Explorer for what, 20 years, 20 plus years? And it's not gonna happen, these things are complex. The more input you take from the outside and the more data processing you do, the more vulnerabilities there's gonna be. That's just how life is. Um, but you should figure out a way to update these things when flaws are found. Uh, as we saw before, um, it was probably pretty expensive for Chrysler to recall 1.4 million vehicles, send out those USB sticks, right? Um, I'm not you know, trying to continually punch them in the face, but if you're gonna have internet connected stuff, you would think you would want the ability to update that. And I understand there's probably products that aren't made to be updated because you know there are limited use and limited impact but if you have something that say is controlling physical aspects of a big machine I think you want ways to update that without asking everyone courteously to come bring it back to you to get it fixed lastly um, at least from my perspective researchers keep researching uh, I want more people to look at this stuff that's why that's why I like all the low pack low-impact low uh, IoT research because it teaches people how to do these things. It's really an intimidating task the first time you have a, a circuit board and you're trying to pull a chip off of and you're burning your fingers with your soldering iron. You don't know what you're doing. It sucks. It really does. But it, it helps when you have diagrams and other people have done the same. And it gives you inspiration to keep doing these things. So I, you know, I want the Michael Coppola's of the world to keep doing these things. I want people to look at cars. Like no one has a monopoly on research. I'm always amazed, like I want more people to do car research. Like Charlie and I don't have a monopoly on it. We, we, we release all this information because we want people to look at these things. Uh, I, you know, I, I want more security people, more researchers, to look at all the stuff out there because, uh, you know, hopefully by, by continually reviewing uh, pieces of software and hardware, we can make them better and we can have more stuff. I, I like technology. I like all the cool stuff we're going to have. I'm going to be mad that I'm going to be dead before like 500 years from now when we have really cool stuff, right? So like, let's make cool stuff now so I can have it because I'm selfish. Um, so, I mean, that's about it, and uh, those are my thoughts on cars, internet security of things, and all that stuff. So if there's any questions, let me know. Thank you. Morning. How you doing? I'm getting caffeinated, so we're getting there. Beautiful. Um, so question for you. Um, so I'd seen the work and the work that's been done in the past with the Prius, I think it was a Ford Explorer. Um, so, I, I have to admit, personally, I see this as a double, this particular proof of concept as a double-edged sword, and I, I want to hear your, your thoughts on this. So, doing that on a freeway seemed a little dodgy, so that's one side of the sword. Now, the other side of it I see is, you know, now we have, now it's getting real attention. Um, so, I'm, 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 I'm on how to on how to take the whole thing. So I'm curious, actually, if you could just, I'd love I'm to understand. Not, I'm not flummoxed at all. Okay, but why why on why on a freeway? So I guess that's the question I have for you. So so a, a, a few things. First of all, uh, you guys see the movies, right? Like, in the, they can like make cars flip upside down. You ever see uh, someone do something sensational on an internet video? Um, you know, videos can be edited to make things look more dangerous than they actually are. Second of all. Um, if you watch 60 Minutes, uh, a few 
uh, what, months before that, um, the UWASH researchers did their exact attack from 2011 uh, on a car in a parking lot with helmets and cones. Uh, does anyone remember seeing that? All right, guess what happened? Nothing. Uh, you know, so we, we, we wanted to relate to a person. And, and in all reality, what we did was make it so the, the, the equivalent of you taking your foot off the, the, the acceleration pedal. So um, I have zero regrets, and I think the impact was worthwhile uh, what we did. Ronde Lambrink uh, with UL. Uh, a question I have, this canvas element is coming back in a lot of presentations on uh, car security and uh, car safety. Any ideas on better protecting this bus? Um, is it like about data segregation or like what are the measures that you foresee will be uh, feasible to implement as a design for the CAN bus? Yeah, you know, as I said before, I'm, I'm sure there's people way more qualified than me figuring out um, how to better design a CAN bus. What you have to look at is how many are out there and how many are going to be like they are for now. Right? I think the average lifespan of a car in America is 11.2 years. Um, we have that stat somewhere. Um, so you can't just think about how to fix it. You have to think about how to work with what you have. Uh, that's why, like, Charlie and I created this intrusion uh, detection and prevention system for a CAN bus. So at least you could detect attacks. So I think things like that hold merit um, because you're not, you can't change the physical architecture and how they work, but hopefully you can add something new to it um, that will improve the security. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much. It's fascinating stuff. So thank, thank you. you for the great work. Uh, I was just curious, you talked a little bit about this, if maybe you can dig a little bit deeper into it, because you know, prior to this coming out, one thing that the automakers had been emphasizing, at least for us and to our research, was, oh, these systems are separate and the control systems are completely, uh, you know, there's a big wall between the control systems versus uh, the connected car systems. You folks were able to... Um, access a portion of it, right? Not, not all the control systems, but a portion all, of it. All of them. Oh, you got all of them, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, can you go into a little bit more yeah. how it, it, it wasn't yeah. as disconnected as they said? So, I mean, I, I think that, that people um, misinterpret the term air gap. So if you actually looked on the two physical boards in the head unit, there was a gap between them, a little air gap. Um, but at the same time, they had a connector that was a serial line that was used from ro reprogramming one portion to another portion, right? So in people's mind, it's two separate chips. So like, yeah, it's two separate chips. But if there's communications between these two chips of any kind, there is a possibility for vulnerability and attack. So I think people's concept of segmented portions um, needs the vision of someone who knows security, where they may be two separate microcontrollers, but at the same time they communicate, so essentially they're one. The, the, the earlier panel said um, some, what was this on? Okay. The earlier, pan, earlier panel said something about consumers being able to maybe purchase the minimally functional device, have, you know, purposely try not to buy something that's more complicated than they need, and you've done a lot of research with microcontrollers. Do you have any concerns in the future we're going to have, for, per, for reasons of, of cost, basically a bunch of fully fledged Linux computers running around with four or five different radios in them, um, just because that's the cheapest way to manufacture the part? Yeah, I mean, I, that's just the reality of it, right? If you, if you buy these microcontrollers and you're a company, you want the cheapest product with the most features. So these are things that are just going to come about. Uh, I don't think, you know, most, most people who make things don't want super stripped down portions of uh, some kind of machine they're making because they want the most bang for their buck. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I really like your energy. Um, I have a couple questions. Have you ever worked with drones, hacking drones? And I mean, if, even, if, if, even if not, um, what are your thoughts on the implications of those being hacked? Because on roads, I understand, I mean, that it's, a, it's one plane. But with air traffic, I mean, we're hearing stories about drones around airports, drones around Air Force bases, and um, interfering with different airspace. There's different, many types of planes that fly at different levels, and Amazon's about to deliver everything via drone. 
I had no idea about the sprint network of your thing, but if they have such a range, it's probably going to be on a network. Does yeah, I've, I've never looked at drones, so I have no clue. I mean, there's complexities with all this stuff. Um, so someone should do some drone research. That, that would be my recommendation. Someone, someone pick up and start getting some drones and doing some research and publish it. Awesome. Uh, Good to hear. Good morning, Chris. I have to say thank you so much for bringing off this morning on such a great note. There is great energy in the room. And you brought up a point that I don't think has been touched upon yet, and I really wanted to thank you on. You notice that Harman has uh, its fundamental flaws, and they are yet to be fixed. And we're not really too certain about that. So I wanted to ask you, in regards to these fundamental flaws, what are we supposed to be doing when there is no differentiation in memory between instruction and data? What is separating Harman's code from exfiltrating its files, you know, from what it should be doing and determining where everything should be sent? So what should we do with this fundamental flaw? Um, if I had the answer to that, I wouldn't be in this room and I'd be drinking uh, drinks out of a beach out of a coconut somewhere. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, you know, th there's a bunch of different things you can do. You can have, you know, I think you want to know if data's being exfiltrated. I, I think you want to know if you're being infiltrated, right? I mean, like I said, I worked at ISS back in the day, and I, you know, there were various aspects of that product that I thought were fantastic. Um, I, I think since we are moving towards these things being much like our laptops and, and desktops, that the security posture should uh, reflect what we already know. Uh, you know, there's a lot of security companies out there. Uh, Microsoft has gone through a lot of uh, pain being the security insecure poster child for years. We should learn from those lessons of these people that already had them and, and, and try to make things more secure for these things that we have. Over here. Um, uh, first of all, it was, it was a really clever hack. Um, I, I admire the hack. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Um, and it, it, as you know, it wasn't completely straightforward getting in because of the gap you alluded to. Um, and because of that, I'm curious, since you have tried to penetrate these systems for some period of time, and I think it's difficult to impossible to engineer a solution with perfect security. Um, there are people who write code for nuclear power plants or manned spacecraft or things like that who spend years and years and years trying to get the code perfect with huge teams looking at it and spending millions of dollars and things like that. So we have analysts telling us there are going to be hundreds of millions or billions of things all over the place, and they're all potentially vulnerable. And developing secure code is expensive, and we have people who try to go in and find flaws in this. What are your thoughts as somebody who's going in and finding the flaws of what the trade-off is between how much time do you spend securing it versus how do you get it out there and in the product at a reasonable cost point? I mean, these, these companies aren't just security companies, right? They're product companies, and they have release cycles, and they have to get things out. Uh, I think cars are a good example, right? You want the code as secure as possible, but at the same time, you can't say there's no 2016 Chevy Cobalt. You can't, you can't say, like, ah, oh, we'll get it out next year or the year after, right? Like, I mean, that, Microsoft can delay Windows 10 for as long as they want, and people are still going to buy it. But with stuff, you need to release. Otherwise, you become irrelevant in the marketplace. So that's a pressure that most of these places don't have. Um, obviously, you know, uh, security and, and getting features is always uh, a balance beam. Um, the one thing I do have to say is security is hard because... You have thousands of kids going to university to study computer science, right? And it makes these people good programmers. And they're way better programmers than, I don't know, probably most of the people in this room, right? Um, but at the same time, security isn't their focus. Their focus is making things that work well. Um, so, I, you know, you're, you're always going to have to have the security afterthought because the concept of security and secure programming is probably lost a lot, uh, amongst many of the people that actually write our software, whether it's antivirus, nuclear power plants, or a web app. Last one. Make it count. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I wanted to sort of follow on that because there is clearly, you know, with billions of devices, some things will be insecure, but I'll venture to say that most of them by themselves don't represent a large vulnerability. But what you've pointed out is you can take a series of devices with relatively small vulnerabilities and the system's effect of their being connected together results in large vulnerabilities. Do you see any approach to even systematically finding those, let alone 
uh, addressing those with regulation or testing? I'm not a regulation guy. I don't know anything about it, so I, I can't comment that. But I mean, at this point, where there's just not even enough people to look at it. So there's like right now, there's no real good way to to solve these problems. We need protections, and we need auditing, and you need uh, you know exfiltration detection, and all these things. So um, it's still really in its infantile stages. I wish I had a better plan. Uh, like I said, if I did, I'd probably be a bazillionaire and, and not be here today. So I don't know. Uh, good luck. Thanks very much.